yes, uh, let's uh, probably speak about RAG. And um, before that, um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk. I think that's the formal bit. And I know this is the last talk of the conference, and I hope I can see some uh, cheerful faces and like some enthusiasm. Yeah? OK. <laughs> Perfect. So we would be speaking about a three-letter word today, which is hottest in generative AI right now, RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. And please bear with me, because the talk is going to be only for 20 minutes, so I've tried to compress it as much as possible. But you have the reference on YouTube with that uh, you can use later uh, for the reference. So let's do RAG. Let's talk about RAG evaluation. Um, before that, um, cheers to Peter, who gave amazing talk yesterday, and uh, I think he laid a pretty amazing groundwork for this talk today. Uh, what he uh, kind of started talking about was the RAG evaluation, and I'm going to be taking it forward and would we'll be speaking about um, further, you know, about uh, different RAG evaluation frameworks and more like a meta comparison, which would be useful to you in the next stage that he proposed. So. The title of my talk is Deciphering Evaluation Essential for RAG, and my name is Atita Arora, and I work as a solution architect at uh, Quadrant. So we would be starting off with a uh, little bit, you know, uh, look at the generative AI space at the moment. So there's, there are two studies that were published probably like last week, and if you kind of, you know, put together the numbers, you would see that most of the effort is going into RAG at the moment, like people are really uh, putting the focus on building some sort of like customer uh, chatbots, customer facing assistance. And if you put together all of these uh, figures, it would be close to like 65 to 70% of uh, the generative AI use cases are around RAG. And the other figure shows um, that the concentration of the effort in the next uh, zero to three years would be in the hallucination management and in building more of such assistance, which is why we need to speak about how do you evaluate and build better RAGs. So that's a bit about myself in case uh, this talk um, is interesting, you find it interesting, and you want to get connected with me. I started in the information retrieval space in uh, 2008, and uh, I love open source, and that's why I'm here. And uh, I love speaking about and working on vector and semantic search, language analysis, and information retrieval. Duh. So this could be a little bit small, but then bear with me, there are different ways in which RAG could be implemented. One of the ways that Peter discussed in his talk yesterday was a naive way where you process all the documents and kind of uh, process them and put them uh, encoded and indexed into a vector DB or the knowledge store, where there's a knowledge retrieval unit or the answer processing unit that basically interacts with your LLM and processes a relevant answer for you. There is an advanced form of the uh, RAG in which you could do the query enrichment, you could do the result treatment, like re-ranking, fusion, whatnot. There are like so many different things happening there. And then there is agentic RAG. I'm sure you must have heard about like the self-improving RAG using DSPy and frameworks that could basically let you choose the tool uh, at the time that you're querying or interacting with the RAG. So why did I show this to you is because there was a critical component in all of these rags and which was a knowledge base or a vector database. And at this point in time, I would like to introduce you to the company that I work for, that's Quadrant. And why do we need to focus or make a meticulous choice about this framework or the tool is that because it has to be very performance centric. I mean, uh, Quadrant is based on Rust, which is why you can trust the performance. It's scalability oriented, quick and easy to start with. And of course, uh, when we talk about RAG, we talk about knowledge management, which is basically done on huge amount of you know, text or documents, so, which is where resource optimization focus by supporting different ways of uh, quantization comes into the existence. And it's a fully open source project. You can build whatever you want with it. And all the embeddings are supported out of the box. Marketing over. <laughs> so let's look at the RAG evaluation um, uh, landscape at the moment. So you would see that uh, this is the tag cloud that I generated with all different kind of uh, uh, metrics that these frameworks expose and different companies that are building tools around it. And of course, I know this looks a little bit of confusing kind of a figure, but I hope it makes sense. I would be decomposing this into a tabular format as well for you to understand, comprehend it better. So why does anyone should be focusing on um, evaluation at all? So I think uh, there were 
discussions about uh, that evaluation is important, but uh, I try to put together, summarize into that uh, it is needed to ensure the correctness as well as reliability of the situation or the solution, uh, performance and improvement. If it's uh, actually giving you response in the required amount of metrics or the latency requirements that you uh, have with your application. Of course, hallucination is one thing that uh, definitely is like uh, a nightmare for some of these solutions, so hallucination management is definitely required. User satisfaction, because you would be building the solution for someone to consume, um, they need to be uh, satisfied with the solution. It should comply to your needs, and the team should have a confidence in rolling out uh, this in production. So that's why evaluation is needed. Um, what if you don't do it? What if you can just skip the evaluation part? Well, in that case, you would run into a situation like this. I'm sure you must have seen this uh, floating around uh, Twitter, X, uh, for quite some time, and where the Google was recommending you to eat rocks a day uh, using glue to stick your cheese onto your pizza. Don't do that. That's just a dis disclaimer. So yeah, you could run into a very bad situation, and you would not want to you know, make that happen with your solution. And that's why you should be doing evaluation, for sure. So there is like constant uh, hustle about, you know, how do you correlate these metrics? How do you find like, which is the one for me? How do I understand uh, which one is growing, which one is not growing? And how, do that, how does that affect my, uh, you know, overall application quality? And also, all of these solutions that we're talking about today, in this uh, talk, they are all using AI as a judge. So how reliable is AI as a judge? And we know that the values are not deterministic. They don't kind of you know, represent uh, linearly. There are frameworks about it. There are talks about it. There are papers about it. I have uh, figured out that it's, it's a good idea when we talk about the evaluation framework as long as you know, it's giving you quantitative results. You can measure something as long as they're reliable, as long as they're explainable, because that's the crux, because we're going to be relying too much on semantic uh, search. And they should be deb debuggable, because ultimately, if you cannot debug and reproduce the issue, you would not be able to resolve it. So yeah, it's also looking kind of like really dense slide. It's um, very uh, heavy, but then this is what uh, I've tried to do here, that I've tried to bifurcate the metrics into uh, like different categories. Uh, so foremost, uh, precision and relevance, which is important because if you can't retrieve it, you can't generate it. So of course, precision relevance is um, paramount. Faithfulness and groundedness, because we want to make sure that it's uh, rendering good responses, uh, relevant responses, and they're using the context uh, properly. Uh, also, the context is uh, sufficient as well to answer the question. Hallucination management, of course, has to be there. Semantic syntactical similarity, because some of these solutions may require you to uh, return the results in certain syntax, so that's, that has to be there. Of course, if you're going to be building uh, chatbots, you need to make sure that uh, they're coherent, they're concise. Um, if it requires any sort of like summarization, uh, it should be uh, um, kind of evaluated for the summarization accuracy as well, and above all, correctness and accuracy of the responses by different mechanism, and above all, uh, the safety and the guardrails. I think this is probably like the understated mechanism of uh, the answers, but I've listed like quite a lot of features here. So what we would be doing next is how do you pick relevant metrics? So that's something I often deal with because when I speak to the customers, they're like. OK, so this is this framework. These are the metrics that are provided. What, are re what is relevant for me? So try to take an example. And the reason why I took this example, I would tell you in, in the later part of the presentation. So we would start with uh, talking about a real use case. So RAG is used for knowledge management or document management or uh, where the knowledge is spread across like different silos. So you want to put uh, it all together. So Ultimately, you want to make sure that your answer is correct. The quality of your answer is like the main focus. So you would be focusing on answer correctness, which basically would depend on the query fulfillment. Uh, you can make sure that the answer is complete. Um, it is satisfying all the user needs by doing something like a completeness check. You want to make sure that your answer is faithful, is grounded to the context provided, so context, context uh, utilization, making sure that your context is sufficient to answer the, gener uh, the uh, generated answer. And of course, we want to make sure that the quality of the retrieved chunks is abiding by the precision recall in the CG or so many different retrieval metrics that already exist. Uh, apart from that, you want to make sure that 
the answer that is generated by the RAG is helpful, bias-free, non-malicious. And if you have any compliance requirement, it's not sharing any personal information. It's concise because we want to utilize less tokens. I mean, that's where the cost is coming from. And uh, also making sure that it's uh, replying back in the given requirement of time. So I hope that made uh, a little bit of a picture as to how, to how do you choose like metrics. I hope this was helpful. 20 minutes, please remember. So we would be doing a meta comparison between different platforms. Um, there were no favoritism happening. I'm not going to be telling you my favorite tool here. It's, it's just a meta comparison. I've tried to take like random tools, the three of them, um, uh, Arise Phoenix, Quotient AI, and Ragas is something that I've already worked with. The others I'm still evaluating. Athena, Iwal, uh, you would be seeing like some more work about that. I would be speaking in the future as well. So um, let's go ahead. I hope this is not too small. You can still see it. So we would start with like how many or uh, different metrics, evaluation metrics that are supported by each of these platforms. So as you can see, they're mostly like ticks, like the green ticks, which means that this metric is supported. And on my uh, left hand side, I mean, I've tried to uh, put together like the metrics as in uh, precision relevance, uh, hallucination summarization, and the other aspect that I exposed to you in, in the previous slide. Along with that, I've also added like custom metrics. So if it is easier uh, to add like the custom metrics in your RAG pipeline as well using these tools. So this pretty much is supported by all the tools. So what do we do next? We could probably start with how easy it is to use this tool. So as you can see that I've tried to evaluate them based on uh, are they supporting different data types? Are they supporting synthetic data, uh, evaluation data generation? Um, is it easy to initialize and configure them? Is it easy to kind of extend or customize them? Are they uh, you know, uh, using uh, popular LLMs, or can I add my own LLM to it? And uh, above all, is it offered as like self-hosted or managed service? So that's like another comparison that uh, I've tried to make. I'm going to rush through this, because I'm sure like, you can refer back to this uh, on YouTube as well. So one of the other things is like community support and adoption. Of course, when you're using anything open source, you want to make sure that it's uh, something if I would run into um, you know, like a situation where I'm not able to like, move forward, you would want to make sure that you have somewhere to kind of you know, reach out to these people. And uh, I think the, the criteria here is, first of all, license, making sure that you can use it for the commercial purpose. So there are like the different licenses. For Athena, I did not have the information about the license, which is why it's left empty. So, Apart from that, the documentation, uh, that's available for most of all of the tools. So, and it's a pretty good one as well. They're providing like the cookbook examples. The other one is the engagement, uh, which you would see uh, based on like the stars it has, the community members that it has. Uh, for Quotient, we don't have anything. And the reason is because it's a proprietary tool, which is why we were not uh, told about like if these exist anymore uh, for, for this uh, tool particularly. If there is support available for these tools, so that's also available for nearly all of them. Another thing that's important is because you would not want to kind of you know, constantly run into like evaluation, experimentation. You would want to make sure that there is some way that you can compare results. You have some visualization of seeing how's the drift, how did you basically you know, make ch some changes, and how is it reflecting on your um, results. So first of all, starting with like, is there a UI available, or is there a UI integration available? So in some way or the other, like, you should be able to see uh, on the user interface if uh, there's some sort of like way I can visually uh, interact with the results. Apart from that, is there a support for comparative experimentation? Like you can compare with uh, Algo 1 and Algo 2. So that's also pretty much available in all the tools except uh, Ragas. I think I'm sure they would be coming up with that as well. Uh, apart from that, visual presentation, more like fancy graphs which are needed for people who are making decisions. So in some of the tools here, this is available only in the paid version. So watch out for that. Apart from that, you would definitely be doing this in production, I mean, apart from the POC. So for there, we want to make sure that it's able to handle like, the you know, load of the um, questions or the volume of the questions that you would be running it on. Uh, security, uh, role-based access control. These are kind of important features. Uh, compliance, if it has already support for that. Total uh, count for tokens, because that's going to be basically reflecting or uh, decompressing into the cost that you're spending to generate these answers, or if the tool is already uh, telling you about the cost of evaluation. Another important thing is because if you're running into production, you don't want to evaluate on everything. There's some way or the other to control the sampling size, and that's available in two of the tools here. 
So apart from that, I think these are the USPs of each of these tools, like Langsmith, it's, it has the trust of the Langchain community. Apart from that, it has the cap capability for human evaluation. Quotient AI provides you with a structure and rapid improvement uh, through experimentation process. Phoenix has the ability to let you, you know, do the tracing and explainability of the results. Athena is focusing more on the end-to-end -end metrics and uh, kind of uh, promoting experimentation. If you might have noticed, they were exposing more than like 40 uh, metrics. Rag Vegas is first and the foremost. Uh, they've also published a paper about it. Deep eval has the proprietary GEVAL, which is based on the chain of thought, which is pretty amazing. So apart from that, uh, as I said before, all of these frameworks use LLM for most of the evaluation. LLM as a judge is somewhat not a silver bullet. Overemphasizing on certain evals can definitely hurt the uh, performance. Factual inconsistency or hallucination is a persistent problem. So don't be taken aback by that. And none of these mentioned frameworks I think this was like something which was very essential for me, was that uh, they do not uh, do anything to do with data pre-processing, like helping you assess if this is the right chunk size, if this is the right overlap, if it's missing something of that sort. And I think that's what I'm missing in all of these frameworks. So apart from that, these are some good reads. There's uh, this uh, study published by uh, O'Reilly. Uh, there's a there are link provided in all of these slides um, as well, which talked about like the lesson learned by uh, putting RAG in production. And if you want to play with anything of the sort in action, it's a good idea to go to this repo, uh, Quadrant Track Eval. Uh, we've run the workshops. This is the YouTube link in case you're more of a visual person. You want to see uh, like how these uh, were done in practice. Apart from that, this is an open source uh, library. And of course, um, you can contribute. You can contribute your experiments. I would be extending this uh, to add more experiments about the libraries that I spoke about today. So apart from that. I think that's pretty much it about my talk. I hope I made it in like 20 minutes, and I hope this was still fruitful. You learned something from the talk. I guess we can take some questions. And, and one thing that I forgot to mention was there are some really amazing stickers and t-shirts from Quadrant. Um, please make sure that you grab one. I would like that. Thank you. Thank you, Atita. Questions? Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you, have you checked um, frameworks that employ transformers, smaller models, to do evaluation, some scoring, maybe uh, with some sort of fine tuning, for example, Aris framework from Stanford, yes. or something like yes. that? that that's a so I think that's a good point. I mean, I was definitely going through like time of my life when I was choosing like which ones should I compare. Uh, there are two reasons why I selected these because I'm like actively researching on them. Aries is definitely like out there. Uh, it's it is on my radar, but I haven't picked it as of yet. Another thing is that uh, like um, that is more of a framework, I would say. And these are actually uh, like the tools that you would be using, and that's probably the reason. So that's like my, my reason why I did not pick Aries, if that was your question. And one more question. Do you have a feeling uh, that maybe instead of LLMs as a judges, we will be using something else? Uh, uh, for what? I mean, uh, maybe in the future we will switch to smaller transformer scores or some, some other approaches, not just LLMs as a judges. Yeah, I think th that's a good point. I'm also looking for something very similar because, I mean, if you, you have spoken about that in your talk as well. So I think we realize this, that this is definitely like an expensive affair because, as I said before, all of these approaches are using LLM in the back end, and LLMs are expensive, which is why people are trying to, you know, introduce metrics like it should use only these many tokens. So I think time uh, is um, like time is going to tell, maybe, that we need to come up with the approaches that do not rely completely on LLMs. So I'm definitely seeing that happening in the future. And plus, I think one of the other things that I did not mention is that uh, I think one thing that I'm really liking about this space is that people are stopping to reinvent the wheel. Like, for example, a lot of people, whatever has been done in Ragas, they're not doing it again in their platform. They're uh, like building an integration for Ragas, which is, I, I feel like it's a clever move. So I think something very similar, I hope, would be happening in the LLM space as well. So Thanks. Sure. Thanks. Um, you showed those two examples, you know, from Google, where it was hallucinating. Yes. 
how do you propose to you know run evaluation and filter those out? It seems like there is a long tail of you know kind of common sense errors that these models can make, and you know same that's, is true for like driverless cars and so on. So that is true, and that's a good point. I think that's where the human evaluation comes into the picture. We need, as of now, I feel like all of these tools or even the process is not uh, you know, mature enough to be able to make such a decision by itself. So there has to be something that should be sitting on top, verifying that this should not be part of these signals or this, this is what the, uh, maybe the, the um, algorithm or the application should not learn from. So I think human evaluation is something that could help. Apart from that, I think data is something that would be uh, super useful and I think, which is what I mentioned, uh, these two things, I mean, data pre-processing evaluation is something that's not done by any of these frameworks, and human evaluation is done by just one. So I guess that's a way forward as well. Thanks. So we're almost out of, we are really out of time, but just take one last question. Thanks for the talk. So Phoenix, you said it's like nice for tracking and explainability. Can you elaborate a little bit the type of explainability we would expect? That's actually a good point. I mean, uh, I would highly recommend you to go and watch this YouTube as well that I had uh, a webinar with them. So one of the key things is that, you know, sometimes it is hard to understand that why this result was rendered and why the other one was not rendered. So I think what uh, Phoenix provides you is that you can actually dive into each of the question, into the mechanism how it was being retrieved. So you can look into the documents retrieved and you can uh, verify that you know maybe this was not retrieved because it was probably expecting an exact match or it was probably you know relied on um, some other aspect, and which is how you can basically fix your uh, retrieval pipeline as well. Apart from that, if uh, someone like maybe um, more like a semi-technical or a non-technical person dealing with that, it also provides a snippet about it, that the question was about this thing, the answer was about this thing, so I was missing this aspect from the question. So as I said, they're using LLMs pretty heavily to explain these results, but it's just about like uh, how do you uh, render it to the user. So that's what they do. They, they explain it in a layman term that you know, this is what was missing in the result, and which is why I gave it this much scoring which is super useful. Thank you.